Okay, for chapter one, it's always the most complicated chapter. There's lots and lots of content in it, but it's a great way to get oriented with the course material for developmental lifespan. So let's just go ahead and we're going to take a peek at a few of the topics. Obviously, I won't be able to cover everything in this um, presentation here, but I wanted to provide you with a little bit of background to help you understand the con um, content within the chapter. So one of the first things you'll see is your author, Laura Burke, really explains how complex the developmental process is and one of the ways in which you can think about um, development and the different kinds of influences is by thinking about um, either age graded influences, which by um, just knowing how old someone is, you can make some kind of general judgments about them. So if you know you're looking at a two year old, you know at this point they're um, certainly able to walk and they may even be running at that point. Um, if you look at someone, uh, a woman kind of mid, uh, you know, in her middle adulthood years, you might um, expect them to be faced with um, issues of menopause, things like of that nature, puberty during adolescence. There's also history graded influences and those are things that happen in the world that can impact development. So the Great Depression is an example of that, the onset of technology, um, you know, even just having access to the internet and, and that really has changed significantly the way in which um, folks have developed. Um, for instance, if you even just take social development and how the internet and social media has really taken off and impacted um, the way that folks develop. And then, of course, there's non-normative influences. So these are situations that don't affect everyone, but do affect some people. So if a child was abused, um, that certainly is going to have a significant impact on their um, you know, lifelong development. And other positive things also can influence it. So, for instance, if you win the lottery, that also would impact you significantly. Um, you know, and some of that may be in a positive and some of that may be in a negative way. Um, one of the other things you'll notice in this chapter is that it provides you with kind of an overview of many of the key theorists that you'll need to know in this um, throughout this uh, course. Now, the chapter is going to just kind of orient you to it. You'll certainly be hearing a lot more about several of these theorists as we move through the lifespan. Um, but I do want you to go ahead and pay attention to these, and you should have had some familiarity. That's why I have this idea here called dusting off the cobwebs. If you can recall what you learned in your Intro to Psych class, um, it certainly will help. But as you read through Chapter One and you revisit these theorists, I think you'll start. It'll start to come together. I'm not going to go into great detail here about the theorists because we'll be talking about them a lot more as we go through the different chapters. I do want to spend a little bit of time on research methods, though. I, I find that students often struggle um, with differentiating between different types of research studies that have been done, and I think it's really important for you to do so. You'll notice that I'll be asking you to um, dive into the library databases and find research studies, and I want you to be able to interpret them appropriately by knowing on what type of study they are. So the three main types of studies that I'm going to refer to first are the experimental, correlational, and descriptive methods. The experiment's really the, the kind of best way to do research in most cases because it's a very carefully controlled um, situation. You'll see on the visual on the right that there are experimental groups and control groups. And in order for these um, experiments to really be able to talk about cause and effect, there needs to be random assignment to the groups. So what that means is, is that the students um, or participants who are in the experimental group need to have an equal chance of either being in this group or that group. So you basically get a big group of people and then whatever variable you're going to test, and we'll go over those variables and what they mean in a moment, you need to make sure that there is an you know, just randomly assigning them. So it's like sort of like pulling names out of a hat. So that's what you're doing. And if you do that, then that's really going to allow you to say causation. Now, the reason for that really is, is because it controls for what's called confounding variables. So let's go ahead and take a look at um, how this might play out. So the best way to really take a look at it is by looking at an example. So if we look at the effects of playing violent video games on behavior, we're going to start out with some kind of a hypothesis. So the researcher may think that playing violent video games will lead to aggressive behaviors. Well, the first variable that we're going to need is called an independent variable. The independent variable is the variable of interest that you want to manipulate. And in this case, it's playing violent video games. The dependent variable is the outcome. You know, what do we expect to happen as a result of this independent variable? And in this case, the researcher is hypothesizing aggressive behaviors. 
There's other variables which are called confounding or sometimes extraneous variables which can get in the way because there certainly are more um, than one, you know, there's certainly more than one thing that can impact aggressive behavior. Um, perhaps the person's biology, you know, maybe they're genetic, um, maybe they're more genetically predisposed to engaging aggressive behaviors. Environment, maybe they are living in an, a culture where, um, you know, abuse and or violence is just kind of the norm and that's going to certainly impact their behaviors. So those are, those confounding variables are the other variables that might get in the way of your research study and you won't really be able to tell whether or not the, de the dependent variable is truly a result of the independent variable. Let's look at it this way. So remember, the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable, that's what we're looking at. And that's usually how the hypothesis is stated. So again, the independent variable is the variable that you're studying, and we're manipulating it um, in some way because we are going to give random assignments to, you know, really help folks decide, um, you know, put them into the groups, whether they're in, in the experimental or control group. And the dependent variable, again, is the outcome variable. All of these bubbles here represent the confounding or extraneous variables. So in this example here, you can see some of the examples of um, confounding variables would be things such as parenting style, um, television viewing, history of aggressive behavior, other biological or environmental factors. So the idea here is, is that we need to randomly assign them into our groups and that controls or equalizes the chance of those confounding variables being in all of our groups. So here's a visual of how our group um, experiment can look. So we, as we said, we would have an experimental group. These are the folks who are playing the violent video games. And then we need a control group. Here I've opted to have two different control groups, one that played non-violent video games and another not playing video games at all. The reason for that is that if you only included the didn't play video games at all, we wouldn't know whether it was just playing video games or playing violent video games that impacts on your dependent variable, which in this case is going to be aggressive behavior. And for the sake of this um, you know, study, we'll just assume that we'll ask teachers and parents to report on those aggressive behaviors. So, of course, this sounds like a great study, but there are a couple of problems with this um, type of research. And one big problem is ethics. Um, we need to provide our participants with informed consent. So if we were doing this study, it sounds like we're looking and targeting children. We obviously wouldn't be able to get consent from their children, so we'd have to ask their parents. So there might be some parents who say, sure, why not? I'll let my child participate in this study. Um, however, what if we find out that the uh, violent video games actually do um, cause aggressive behaviors? Then what are we going to do with those children and those parents? We're just going to say, sorry, thanks for coming and helping us out with the research, but good luck now with getting your child to behave. I mean, that's not really okay. So the idea here is, is we have to consider potential harm that might happen as a result of participating in the study. And that's what ethics boards are all about. So in order to do a research study such as this, you would need to have ethics board approval. So even if people did say, yes, I'll participate, that's not enough in and of itself. You also need to go through some kind of um, process where others outside of your research study are making those decisions. Okay, so now we, we, we kind of came to a crossroad here where maybe we can't really do our study using the experimental method because it may not be ethical. So what we need now is another approach. The correlational method is another way to do this, um, but the correlational method is all about whether or not there's a link or a relationship. You can see the word relation in the word correlational study. Um, so is there a relationship between the two variables? And we can say a couple of things about that relationship. So we can not only say yes or no, we can say how strong is that relationship. And you're going to notice that the word strong is over here on the right and it's also over here on the left. Correlations are represented by numbers between negative 1 and 1, and the closer you are to either 1 or negative 1 has to do with how strong the correlation is. The closer it is to 0, the weaker the correlation would be. So if we had a 0.9, we'd have a very strong correlation. If we had a negative 0.9, we'd have a very strong correlation. Now, the other thing we can also say is the direction of the relationship. So is it a positive or is it a negative one? If it's a positive one, what that means is both the variables move in the same direction. So think about a happily married couple. They're kind of walking along together. So if one goes up, the other goes up. 
So um, if we had a strong positive correlation between violent video game playing and um, aggressive behavior, the more violent video game playing someone did, the more aggressive they would be. On the other hand, it could be a negative correlation. If that happens, then that means one went up and the other went down. So one example of that could be um, the more you're absent from class, the lower your grade gets. Um, or the more you eat at McDonald's, the less healthy you'll be. So those are examples of negative relationships. So correlations can provide you with that type of data. But what it cannot do is it cannot say causation. So the only one that you can say that A causes B um, is when you use the experimental study. Now, the last type of research we, we said we'd talk about is descriptive research. And this is really, if you look at the word descriptive, an opportunity to describe something. So we're not really um, making any, uh, you know, judgments about cause and effect. And we're not even talking about relationships. But there may be a time where we want to just kind of watch and record what's going on. And that would be called a naturalistic study. So, for instance, maybe we're interested in um, the frequency of, how often people text when they're driving, which we all know they should not do. Um, chances are, if you ask folks, do they text while they're driving, many folks are going to say no, even if they really do, because they know that's the right answer to say. So they're just going to give you the answer that you're looking for. However, if you want to get a more accurate perception of that, you may want to park yourself on a um, street corner and on the street corner just kind of sit there and document whether or not folks are texting. Now, of course, there is an observer bias here. Um, if they happen to notice you, they're probably not going to text. But if you are kind of hidden, then it probably would not impact the study so much. There's a lot of educational research where we're using naturalistic studies because they may need to see just what's going on in a classroom. And they're just going to observe and record, basically. Now, the other type of descriptive research is the case study. The case study is when you may not have a large sample size, but you're still interested in investigating an issue. So, for instance, if you were curious about school shooters and why folks go into a school and engage in that violent behavior, well, we thankfully do not have a large group of people to do a correlational study on that. So instead, you would just look at one or a small group of those individuals and you might look at all of their, um, you know, case histories, you know, their prior experiences, whether or not they had any mental illness, whether or not their social connections were strong or not, what their family environment was like. And by doing this in-depth investigation, you're still not able to make any causal statements, but you are able to at least have more information about what's going on in that scenario. Now, developmental research also looks at, you know, there's kind of two primary ways we can look at developmental research. If we start with the longitudinal approach, with this approach, we're using the same children and we're watching them over time. So we'll take two-year-olds and then two years later, we'll wait for them to turn four and then we can assess them again when they're four and then we can assess them again when they're six and so on and so forth. And we can also do this with adults, with adults, you know, maybe we take college students and then we get them when they're 30 and we get them when they're 40 and we assess them on whatever um, variables we're interested in assessing them on. Um, and there's certainly some value to this because it's the same group of folks that follow through the, the path. Um, the, the most significant downside of this is you have to be a very, very patient researcher if you're going to use this because it's going to take you a really, really long time. Um, the other thing is, is that you have some cohort effects. What if there was something that happened during that year? Remember, we talked about history graded influence. So, um, you know, if you think about 9-11, you know, that certainly could impact the development of children of a significant um, horrific event like that. So we may not know whether the, you know, the developmental um, issues that we're seeing at six are a result of just maturation and growing or whether there may be some significant um, event that really impacted all the children that, that would uh, impact our data as well. So another way to go is with the cross-sectional approach. The cross-sectional approach is um, when you take one point in time and you're looking at those two, four, and six-year-olds, but instead of looking at them across, you know, waiting for them to get to be six, we're just taking different groups of two, four, and six-year-olds. And what this allows us to do is really, um, you know, get our data immediately. Um, of course, one of the downsides of this approach is that we are looking at different children. So we again have some issues that it may not, may not be, um, the data may not be perfect or, um, you know, really, uh, 
you know, accurate because it might be something different or unique about the group of six year olds than that group of two year olds. So we're really comparing apples to oranges in a sense because they're not the same students. So there are certainly pros and cons. Your author goes over that. I would love for you to just kind of dive into the chapter and get oriented um, so that you have a good understanding of these research methods. And that's all I'm going to share with you for chapter one. Um, but you certainly have a lot more information within the chapter. So you can go ahead and dive into it and I'll look forward to our conversations on the message board.